You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers for hikers. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi again, and welcome back to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, sponsored by our friends at Trailtopia. We're up to episode number 74, and this week's guest is a very thoughtful guy, Jack Jones or Quadzilla. You may recall that name. He was a hiking partner of Kelly Anderson, Sleeping Beauty, and Edmund Thillon, or Bear. He's got a bunch of interesting points to make about the benefits, or otherwise, of a trail diet. He also carried a ridiculously heavy pack, but being ex-military, the physicality of that didn't really bother him too much. He's got quite a few plans for this year too. Quadzilla, or Quads, will be along in a moment. I've also got Dr. Lynn on this week, but not as Dr. Lynn. This time she's Hiker Lynn, and is telling us about a short trail of about 25 miles near her home in Connecticut, the Charles Ives Trail. But before we get to that, it's dinner time. Do you remember those cold, wet evenings on the trail when you pitched up at a shelter and there was nothing you would have rather had than a beautiful, hot, home-cooked meal? Well, apart from actually going home, you could try out one of the delicious meals from Trailtopia. Why not dig into their spectacular jambalaya with its authentic Creole flavour? Or how about their beef stew? which is loaded with beef, potatoes, carrots, mushrooms, corn, green beans and green bell pepper in a fantastic beef gravy. Go on, try them. Trust me, you're going to love them. Trailtopia, the best of home cooking away from home. Just before we meet Quadzilla, I wanted to tell you something about my plans for this podcast and my other podcasts, Returning to Katahdin, for the coming year. The weekend just passed, I went to a podcasting conference. (laughs) Yes, such a thing really does exist. While I was there, I learned lots of stuff about making the show sound better and clearer and generally how to polish it up. I always try to do my best with that. However, the thing I came away with above all else was that I should be asking you, my listeners, what it is that you want for the shows in 2018. DocSpot is about to be over and I'm already running out of shorter trials to discuss. So I wanted to know if you have any ideas for the middle section of the show. Please let me know. You should know my email address by now. In case you don't, though, it is steve at mightyblueontheat.com. Also, as you heard in the beginning, the two shows are now part of the fledgling hiking radio network, and I will be adding shows to that network over the coming year. I won't be hosting them all, but I want to provide you with as diverse a selection of hiking shows as possible. If you have an idea for a show that you'd like to host, and if you can provide a sponsor, Talk with me about it and we can work out the details. There are a lot of benefits of cross-promotion and all the shows will help all the other shows. I don't want to take up too much of your time right now, but I thought I'd float that out there for your consideration. Now, it's time to meet Jack Jones or Quadzilla. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a guy we've heard of before, but we've never met. This is Jack Jones or Quadzilla. Hi, Jack. How are you? Doing well. Happy to be here, Steve. How are you? Uh, I'm good, thanks. And um, Jack was a fellow hiker at certain parts of the trail of two previous guests, the amazing seven-foot-tall bear and uh, Kelly Anderson or Sleeping Beauty. And well, certainly when Kelly and I spoke and we spoke afterwards in my home, the, she said, you've got to speak with Jack as well. He's so he's so damn funny. So uh, let's see how this <laughs> So yeah, see, see if she's right. <laughs> yeah, I hope I can live up to those expectations. <laughs> so what what was the career path that led you to hike in the AT? Because, you know, not all of us can walk away from work for six months. What were you doing at the time? Yeah, sure. So um, back in 2012, I got an accounting degree and I worked for a couple of CPAs and I just hated that life. And so I was kind of trying to figure out, you know, what can I do that doesn't involve accounting? And so back then I started a website called The Healthy Gamer where um, I taught fitness and nutrition to video gamers because those were my real passions in life. Um, You know, grew up playing WoW and EverQuest and all these other um, games, sometimes 12 hours a day. And it was for me. Hang on. on. Let let, let me prove what I believe to be my street cred. Is WoW World of Warfare? 
Yeah. World of Warcraft, yep. Warcraft, right? <laughs> I knew I'd screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this way it goes. <laughs> There's a street cred gone totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no street cred as a gamer. But Quite right. yeah, you know, I just, I, I, I was totally addicted to those games as a kid and growing, you know, as an adult, I almost failed out of college because I was playing um, World of Warcraft instead of going to class. Oh my and gosh. it was for me, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was finding fitness that, um, really turn my life around and so those those are my big passions in life it was fitness and gaming so i uh, made a website around that and that started into a little business and then from there i uh, uh, became a personal trainer and i opened up a crossfit gym in i think 2015 and then i i got into the from that i got into the startup world and we were building a couple of um well a, a gaming startup where we were wanting to bring kids in to uh, basically teach them life skills from video games and uh, you know that was that was the period I was working on right before the hike and um, we were looking to take on a, a pretty sizable angel you know initial round of investment and yeah. and it just felt it didn't feel you know I was looking at you know if we take on this investment this is going to be my life for the next five or ten years and it felt just dead to me like I you know over those past five years I just felt more and more kind of dead and um, then I read Bill Bryson's book, uh, Walk in the Woods, and the <laughs> idea, I had no idea the Appalachian Trail existed, and the idea of It's amazing of the number of people who say that. It is amazing to me the number of people who say they never knew the Appalachian Trail existed, because I was one of them, by the way. Yeah, isn't that, you know, it seems like such a big deal now, but yeah. uh, before I read that book, I had no idea that, it, I had no idea through hiking was a thing. That seemed just crazy to me. <laughs> uh, uh, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, you know that that book. Uh, reading that, it just lit this fire inside. Like, how amazing would that be to go on this hike? And and you know, long story short, forty five days after reading that book, I had uh, you know exited my uh, share in the company, and um, I was on the trail, and and I wow. really never looked back. And it was it was definitely the right decision. And you know, the uh, I remember the first couple of well, really the first couple of months on the trail, I just felt. I felt like myself again. I felt alive again. I felt, you know, like a human again instead of this, uh, I don't know what you want to say, this robot that was just chasing after success. On the treadmill. You, right? You're on the treadmill. So did you actually go out onto the trail with no plan B? You know, what if you what if you didn't like it after a week? What would you have done? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I never <laughs> thought about that. I guess that's part of my personality is I, I, I tend to make impulsive decisions, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. There, there really was no. There really was no plan B then. That's amazing. I know a lot of people go there without any plan B, and I, I sometimes wonder whether that may be one of the reasons people get down when they come back because they don't have, they don't know what they're going to do off the trail. Now I know you had I, I know you had some military experience in your past. Did you bring some of that experience with you regarding the discipline that you know a long hike really really requires? I know some of it's boring sometimes, but there is a certain thing you have to do every day when you doing a long distance hike and did you get some of that experience or that discipline from uh, being in the military i'm um, sure yeah so i was a uh, infantryman in the army so i think it, it depends a lot like your military experience can really vary widely and i think a lot of it isn't relevant but if you're an infantryman um the trail is is like all the good parts of being an infantryman without all the crappy parts so you know <laughs> you you're used to uh carrying really heavy loads over bad terrain so you're totally used to that. You're used to sleeping in the woods, but now no one's telling you when to get up. No one's telling you, you know, that you can't eat now. Um, we can actually have shelter. They never let us have a tent in the army, so you just sleep outside when it's raining. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's it was like a lot of the AT kind of reminded me back to those times, and I, I just think like, well, this is not nearly as bad as when we had to go a week without, you know, hardly any food and I was freezing cold because we, I did my basic training down in Georgia. Uh, we finished in November and it was just bitterly cold outside, but wow. we didn't have any cold weather gear out there for a week and, you know, that the freezing rains and it was, oh my that was gosh. a miserable time. And, <laughs> and so I think it, it helped a lot to have had those experiences and then to be able to draw them, you know, like, Hey, that didn't last forever. So even if it's, you know, you get rained on in a day, no big deal. It'll pass. You'll, you'll yeah. survive. Yeah. Um, so the physicality of it wasn't too much of an issue for you then? No, was it the really wasn't. And, and um, actually, for me, what helped more was CrossFit. When I 
um, opened my gym, it was, I was working at, you know, getting up at uh, four 30 every morning. And then I wouldn't leave the gym until nine o'clock at night. And it's just, you know, it's so much work. And then there were so many mm-hmm. workouts on top of that, that, um, that taught me how to just deal with physical pain. And, um, and I kept thinking back to that on the hike, like, man, this is a lot easier than when I had that gym. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, so, so, so the physical side of it wasn't too much of an issue. What was the mental side of it like for you? Did you find it? Uh, did you get into that mindset that get up, you know, sleep, get up, eat, hike, sleep, eat, get it, whatever the order is, get, and go to bed? <laughs> did you find that relatively easy to get into as well? Um, yeah, I did. It's uh, you know, I was so I did a couple of train up hikes uh, before, and I was you know, you do six or eight miles with forty pounds on your back. And I'm like, oh, my God, this sucks. How can I do this every single day on the trail? But uh, it was as soon as I got on the trail, that stopped being a problem. And it was just something about being out there and being on this adventure. And pretty quickly, um, your body just adapts to the weight of the pack and and the walking and going up and down the mountains. I mean, Georgia, I remember thinking Georgia, like, wow, this is way more elevation than I had thought the Appalachian Trail was going to be. It seemed like you're just (laughs) constantly climbing (laughs) Oh, there's uh, not, it's nonsense. And the only re- the only purpose of a downhill was to give you another bloody great uphill in about two minutes, wasn't it? Every time you right. go downhill, you knew what was coming. Oh, oh Georgia right. was tough. You never saw anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, it really yeah, was. But it, 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 yeah, it's it's um you know it's interesting thinking back on it because it's for for me the first thousand miles I felt were, I mean relatively easy it wasn't until i got to maine that the trail really felt really difficult and um i you know i made an interesting observation so i never had a day on the trail where i seriously contemplated quitting like it you know in in all honesty i i just for some reason from the very beginning i knew i was going to finish um and i think that mindset helped a, a lot because you would you would meet people and they would tell you, well, I'm hoping to get to Maine or, you know, I'll get to Harper's Ferry and then we'll see how we feel. And those people always usually dropped off somewhere in the middle. But yeah. the people that you would meet that, that you would, they would say, you know, I'm, I'm through hiking, I'm finishing this, you know, that they have, you can just tell they have this determination within and those people generally finished. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's that, you know, there's some magic to making that kind of strong determination within um, that carries you through. It's absolutely got to be a strong commitment. Somebody said to me recently, they they kind of fancy the idea of this. And I said, well, you shouldn't go because unless it's the, the thing you want to do more than anything else this summer, it is not something to play with. It's got to be something that's really within you that you're so determined you want to do it that, you know, you have tough days. I mean, you must have had tough days as well, but really, and it was physically demanding for me in the first place, but I never found it mentally demanding. I thought it, I was always going to do it. I just had to keep going. As long as I didn't injure myself, I would eventually get to the end. That's right. And I think that's um, that's the perfect attitude to have on out on the trail is, you know, it's, uh, and that's actually thinking back to the army, that's something I brought with it is in the army, all you got to do is make it to the next meal, right? That's that's what we always tell each other. Just make it through to the next meal, and you can do that same thing on the AT. You just make it through to the next meal. Um, if you're uh, a lot of times, people get really down in the afternoons and in the evenings when they're just tired. Just you know, just don't make any decisions. Then um, sleep and rest and eat, and uh, you know, feel better in the morning. Yeah, that's right. Now I know that you were adopted from China, and that you've had occasional bouts of depression in your life. Was that dislocation one of the sources of your depression? Because now I've never actually spoken to an adopted person from from China. I wonder how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean it, it definitely. So I've um, since I was about a teenager, I've suffered just um, pretty regular bouts of depression. You know, pretty long periods, two to three months, almost every single year. I mean, mm. really, every single year since I was a teenager. Um, and, and I think a lot of it definitely came from the fact that I was adopted. I was adopted when I was eight years old from China. Um, oh, wow. And so also, you really remember China then? Yeah, I do. I do. And, it, you know, it's imagine leaving every – so, you know, I left my parents. I left my school, my friends, my – all my – you know, every single person I knew in the world, wow. I left and I came to America and, you know, that was back in 95. So you can't, there's no social media, there's nothing to stay connected with them. So, um, and, 
you know, so maybe I would call, um, call back home once a month, but that was the most contact that I had. So, um, that definitely created, you know, internal things that I've been processing and dealing with for the rest of my life. Like I just, I don't connect with people on the same level that I see other people doing. Like I'm, you know, um, which should actually kind of help me on the trail. Cause I, I just, when I leave somewhere, I don't miss people and it's the oddest thing, but you know, that's, that's what it is. Um, uh, you know, but I, I did miss my girlfriend. I got to put that in. There. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well done. Good, good, yeah. good, like good, like catch that was yet. Now, yeah. so what do you, what, what do you regard yourself as you Chinese or are you American? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm ethnically Chinese, but you what, know, do you I, I what do you feel? I guess what do you feel? I would feel? say I'm a human, you know, I, I have a, okay. I don't have too strong of a ties. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, How interesting. Have you been back to China? Uh, I have. I went back in 2005 and saw some of my relatives and wow. Uh, wow. my, uh, you know, my Chinese mom is actually over in Springfield, Missouri. So I get to see her oh, uh, right. quite often. Okay. Um, That's nice. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to pray into that. It just suddenly, suddenly struck me when I was asking you the question that I thought, I wonder what he feels, whether he feels English or, uh, sorry, English, <laughs> American or Chinese. I know you don't feel English. Uh, and I, I wasn't, as you saw, so uh, I won't go into that too much. Did you find that the, once you got out on the trail, that the camaraderie and the acceptance of the people on the trail was different from so-called real life, or as we've heard it called before in this show, synthetic life? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think it's so strange that or interesting that so many hikers say the trail feels more real than real life. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's because right on the trail, you don't have social masks. I think you don't you just don't have the energy for a social mask and you'll meet um, so many different people that in real life, you you would probably, you know, judge them by the clothes they're wearing or, yeah, you yeah. know, whatever, and, and, and just write them off and not even talk to them. But on the trail, it kind of forces that interaction and then you're kind of discovering, Oh, Hey, um, these are, these are all great human beings. And even though we don't have a lot in common on the surface, um, you can find a lot of commonalities Well, in, in, on the trail too. That really helps bond you together. Um, and I, I kept making distinctions between the trail and startups because my gosh, the startup culture is all about competition and you're never rewarded for, you know, being a good person or doing good, or, you know, <laughs> cooperation, you're rewarded for crushing your competition and growing your business and growing your profit. And everyone is always wanting to, you know, everybody wants to get coffee, they want to get coffee, they want to meet. And it's all because they, you have something that they want. And they're trying to, you know, connect with you for that, but not they're not trying to connect with you on a human level, they're not trying to connect with you as a person. So that was just so refreshing to yeah. get on the trail and just, you know, talk to people for the sake of talking to people with no other motives. I think it's part part of it, the mutual respect, because we all know what it took us to get to that particular shelter or wherever we meet somebody. And I, and I like that part of it. And the, the other thing I, the other thing I, I, I loved about it was that everybody was as interested in your success as you were. They wanted you to finish your hike. You know, you wanted them to finish their hike. You know, they were, everybody was encouraging on the trail. And I love that part of it. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, um, you just felt this kind of open hearted connection to people that, that you don't get in regular life. I feel like. That's right. Now uh, let's talk about the hike itself. Now I know you started in May, which is fairly late to start. Um, uh, and you didn't get to Harper's Ferry till August. Did you decide early on that a flip flop was going to be the way forward for you? Or were you planning to go the whole way to Katahdin from that May start? Um, no, I, I didn't have really. I didn't have any plans. I was just going to, uh, May was just the earliest I could get on trail. And so right. I just <laughs> got out, got out there and it actually turned out to be great because, uh, Georgia in May is beautiful. The, uh, you know, everything's green. It's like seventies in the mountains, just yeah. uh, no bugs. <laughs> nice. How should, did nice. You, when did you go through? I went in March in, from oh, Georgia. Man, so you had snow and cold and but I had to start early because I was slow. You know, I wasn't young and fit. I was 61 when I started. So sure. there was no possibility of me starting in May and getting anywhere near Katahdin before about December. So I really had to go early to make sure I could uh, could try to get there. So so sure. you didn't know what you were going to do. You were just heading north and seeing what happened? Yeah. And, you know, I had this kind of attitude of just kind of taking things as they come. When I uh, got to the NOC um, in the guidebook, it said this Thunder River Rafting Company would allow you to um, stay 
a night at their bunk. And if you did, then you could have a free rafting trip the next day. So I was like, heck yeah, I'll do that free rafting trip. <laughs> so we went down, I forget what river that is, but rafted down that river. We got to meet some really cool river guides and, you know, I had lots of little adventures like that, which would, you know, be a bunch of zero days, but they were a really fun adventure. So you know, like in Maine, um, there were just days I might go four miles and see a really beautiful pond and just camp there. Because yeah. how often in life can you have an entire pond to yourself? Um, it's just so beautiful out there. I agree. I got, aren't they beautiful, those ponds as well? And funnily enough, you saying that made me – I've had this constant regret from time to time that there is this feeling with the through hike. You have to hike. You have to keep going. If you don't, you won't get there. And yet uh, I spoke to somebody, Carl Rurig, the mayor, not too long ago, and he said to me, you know, he'd sometimes just camp on the trail and hang out and have zeros on the trail because he kind of liked it. It was just nice not going anywhere or not hurrying, you know, and I, I, that's one of my regrets I think I have, that I didn't spend more time looking at stuff and spending time, particularly by those ponds in Maine. They were just gorgeous. Oh, my gosh. They're so beautiful. And, and I, I agree with you. It's, uh, you know, and it's different for different people. People enjoy different things. So I guess there's nothing wrong if somebody enjoys just crushing big oh, miles. No. But, oh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I kind of had this attitude of, let's, you know, this is an adventure. And let's just see where it takes me. And, yeah. and, and I thought in the beginning, too, hey, if I, you know, if it takes forever to finish, that's OK, as long as I had fun doing it. Right. Um, yeah. So it just it just kind of worked out that. Um, I got to Harper's Ferry in August, and at that time, Pennsylvania was insanely hot and dry, and uh, it seemed like a much better option to go up to uh, to Maine <laughs> rather than yeah, missing out Pennsylvania. I will leave it as the very last thing. It's probably not a bad thing. <laughs> God, that was hard right. work. Pennsylvania, it really was. So, what do you do? You got to Harper's. So, when did you decide? What was the what was the rationale for just going to Qatar and then and flip flopping? Um, it, it was uh, you know the just how hot it was uh, down south, and also oh, right. um, the, you know, looking at my pace up to that point, I wasn't going to make it to Katahdin before weather set in, unless I really push, which I, I didn't want to. So I decided I'd, I'd rather just have a more enjoyable experience. So I I took the train out to DC, and then took another train up to somewhere in Maine, and then a bus to Millinocket, um, and then oh. got a shuttle from the hostel out there in Millinocket. I think Millinocket. I, I'm getting all How these long did it take you? Years. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. How long did it take you to get from, literally from the trail, from Harpers Ferry to Washington, train up to Maine, and then to, to back to the trail? How many days off did you have to have from the trail for that? Um, I want to say it was at least two days, possibly three. So it's very durable. So you're not, you're, it's not as if you're not so much wasting time. It's not as if it's going to be that difficult to do then. Right. It, it wasn't, it was, um, Harper's Ferry was just so convenient with that train line right there. Right. Yeah. Anyway, you told me previously that once you went up Katahdin, um, and you started heading south and then you did, did about 700 miles pretty much by yourself. What sort of impact did that have upon your psyche? Yeah. So that was, um, you know, I, I kind of went through Maine and New Hampshire. I took us two months to go through there. Uh, from August to October with like wow. kind of hiking together with Bear and Kelly and Foodie mm. and uh, Laura and, uh, you know, our, our little group together. And then it was just getting cold while I was in uh, um, Vermont at the Yellow Deli. And that was when I was like, oh, it's the middle of October and I've got over 700 miles to go. I got to pick up the pace <laughs> if I want to finish this thing before winter kicks in. So, uh, yeah, and then, then I, I, from there, I just, I tried to, kind of push 20, 25 a day. Um, right. And, you know, I, so I walked out of the little bubble we were in and there was, um, that was mid October. So uh, there was just less and less people on trail and, sure. uh, and it was getting dark. So by five, so there were, you know, in order to push out 20 in the day, yeah. um, I didn't like waking up early. So I, yeah. I'd get up at eight or nine. And so that meant I was walking um, usually until nine or 10 o'clock at night. So that's four oh. or five hours of walking alone in the dark every night uh too in the cold um so that was yeah, yeah. <laughs> that must have made you feel good <laughs> yeah looking back on it i it's hard for me to figure out how i did that but um i'm sure as you experience once after a thousand you know after 1500 miles on the trail you get into kind of an altered state of consciousness and absolutely uh, and i definitely that was the time when i started to feel depressed 
um, even while on trail. I think it was just right. It's kind of like a isolation for 700 miles. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I I wouldn't recommend it. it. That was the low point of my hike. Those last 700 miles where it was just cold and dreary, and it was you know got snowed on a couple of times and. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, you know. No doubt about it. It's tough. You know, it's a, you've got to get your, your mind right. But even then, you didn't think about quitting, though, did you? No, it was, I think by that point, you're just so close to the end that, you know, and, and or like I said, again, you're getting to this kind of just altered state of consciousness where things that would bother me a lot now, like the cold and the dark and being alone, just don't, didn't. I don't know. It, it was okay. You had your goal and you just went after it. Now, Bear and Kelly are two of my funniest guests on the show. So what do you remember about spending time with the two of them? Because they were just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, they're really, uh, man, trying to think back to them. I mean, the first time meeting Bear, he was sprawled out in a shelter. Uh, it was in the Shenandoahs. My girlfriend had joined me uh, for that. And you know, we walked in and you just see this guy like laying diagonally, yet still <laughs> taking up like half the shelter just laying diagonally. <laughs> you, you kind of have to double check the way. And am I, am I seeing this right? Is he really that big? <laughs> oh, dear. He was a big dude, isn't he? Crikey. Yeah. Is he seven, seven foot tall, isn't he? Amazing. Seven foot absolutely. tall, yeah. Uh, absolutely now, amazing. Uh, just really, really great people. You know, I, I really admired, you know, Bear's character um, and his, I think he told me once that he, he wanted to be the kind of man that could, hike the Appalachian Trail. And, and I, that really struck a chord wow. with me. Like, you know, um, what wow. a great, great, I don't know, goal um, to have. Um, yes, isn't that, isn't, that stra- isn't that strange almost putting yourself in the third person? What would be that person? And that kind of, well, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of nice in its own way, yeah. yeah, what about yeah Kel- was, and what about Kelly? Yeah, and Kelly's just hilarious. I mean, <laughs> but I remember we, we just kept telling her, like, um, you, you know, you got to stop texting when you're hiking, or you're going to fall or, you know, you'll make a lot better miles, <laughs> but, oh, uh, she loved, she loved her phone and she, it, she was just funny all around. She just, um, uh, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to describe, but she was just, you just laugh when you're around her and everything would just be funny. And yeah, she got such an infectious laugh and she, she really has got yeah, an infectious laugh. Yeah. yeah. You'd yeah. almost wonder, you know, Yeah. <laughs> Now, you, you have told me previously about your thoughts on the trail diet, and that's interesting to me, and the impact that it can have on a multitude of things. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's absurd that, right, if you, if you had any professional athlete that said, I'm going to take six months of my season, and all I'm going to eat is pizza and sugar and drink soda and take energy drinks and eat ramen, and that's going to be my diet – you're going to be, you're, you're crazy. What professional, you know, what athlete would do that to themselves? Mm-hmm. Yet that's what through hikers do. We're, we're, you know, through hikers are athletes and you're asking a lot of your body, yet you're fueling it with just the absolute worst stuff that you could find. Um, and I think that contributes a lot to, you know, to things like hiker hunger, to the fact that people um, just are absolutely emaciated by the end of their hike and people have mm-hmm. Um, I think that contributes to a lot of people quitting because when you look at the symptoms of starvation, um, the symptoms are, you know, you're unmotivated, you're fatigued, super fatigued, you, uh, you feel depressed, you feel um, just bad. And when you, you know, I, I recommend people Google a list and you're like, oh, well, that's what through hikers feel like at the end of their hike. Um, so I think people, a lot of people are, yeah, putting themselves into starvation mode. And so I... And I believe that, um, you know, my last 700 miles would have gone a lot better if I had been eating better because my mood just plummeted, um, kind of the last, you know, 700, 800 miles. And it's, um, were you, know, you, were like, you eating all the same sort of stuff, same sort of crap the rest of us were eating then? Yeah, mostly. The only difference was I added a lot more fats, so I got more calories in. So I, I actually mm-hmm. never experienced hiker hunger on the trail except for 100 mile wilderness where I ran out of food the last day. But other than that, I felt pretty full. I didn't come into towns like um, super, super hungry. And so that was a sign to me that, you know, if all these people are feeling hiker hunger, they're just not getting enough calories in. So was it just fats for you? Was that basically eating pe- constantly eating peanut butter? And I'm well on board for that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, peanut butter. I, I would put a stick of butter into my evening meal with like a sleeve of pasta. 
um, nice. just kind of crazy stuff like that. But uh, yeah, you know, like my my next hikes, I'm gonna I'm gonna be changing up completely. Uh, breakfast is gonna be a mix of you know mix up uh, chia seeds and flax seeds and shredded coconut along with powdered coconut milk and wow. then some water. And you just mix that up in a bag. I've tried it at home and it's delicious. And you get all mm. these omega threes and just you know nutrients from this meal. And it's super super filling, a uh, ton of fiber. So that, you know that's what I'm shooting for next time is just get rid of the sugar, get rid of most of the processed carbs, get a lot more fiber, get a lot more nutritious food like these chia seeds and flax seeds. And, you know, there's, um, there's some, a bunch of dried stuff you can buy online from like Harmony House. And so I get a lot more of my dinners with just dried beans and lentils and dried veggies. Wow. Um, and just, you know, I think that's going to make a massive difference. And if this is something that future hikers, I really think you should pay attention to is, you know, the more nutrition you can get on trail and the less you can cut out of, especially sugar. I think sugar is the biggest, biggest factor. Um, yeah. If you can just avoid the sugar um, and eat more nutrition, you're going to perform a lot better and it's going to dramatically increase your chances of finishing. How are you going to supply all that though? You can't <laughs> buy you can't buy that sort of place in most trail towns from memory. I don't remember seeing chia seeds anywhere. No, no, it's going to be, that's going to be, it's going to add an extra layer of headache, but I think it's going to be worth it. Because, Logistically, it's going to be really tough, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to have to figure that out. Um, and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you can only eat that way 50% of the time, but yeah. 50% is better than nothing. Absolutely. And so you're going on another long distance hike, then where, where are you going? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, um, I'm going to get on the Arizona Trail mid-March. Um, so that'll be, 800 miles in Arizona and then nice. uh, the Continental Divide Trail in mid-June um, do that southbound. Um, oh, wow. So that should take, you know, uh, four months roughly. So it'll be another, what, 3,600-ish miles this year, hopefully. Wow. <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. So hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So plan B turned out to be no plan at all. <laughs> so, you, so that thing. So what actually are you doing now to allow yourself to do this again? Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm really lucky in that um, healthy gamers still brings in income. So, um, and all it's right. all pretty passive now. So it, it was nice being on trail. Um, I could just see the uh, the deposits coming in, and I didn't have to do anything about it. So that that gives me enough to live cheaply. And so mm -hmm. I've kind of decided that while I have this opportunity, I should just keep doing the things that I want to do, which is um, one of them is to do all these hikes. And and I really wow. think in the long term that kind of you know, this is what my heart wants to do. And one thing that the trail teaches you is to stop worrying, right? It's kind of the, the trail magic happens just when you need need it, right? Yes. And so oh, I yeah. think that, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that gives you a glimpse of how the universe actually works. And I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to follow this path and see, hey, if I follow my heart, and maybe it doesn't make logical sense, maybe there's no, I'm not, you know, I don't have a great, it's not a great business plan. But I think in the end, right? The universe is going to provide. And already I'm just kind of seeing, okay, there are these opportunities where I can support myself while hiking, while while doing this kind of stuff. It sounds like the trail is already providing for you. I mean, that is amazing that you can actually live on the passive income that you've set up uh, and from something you were doing quite some time ago. So that's pretty cool. And I know that you've got this new website and it is, there's definitely a clue in this title, Couch to Trail website. What are you planning for people to learn if they go to that website? Yeah, so that is my my uh, next project is I see a real void in the long distance hiking space for fitness and nutrition advice. Um, just like I said, right, like everyone is still out there eating uh, honey buns and uh, drinking <laughs> sodas. They are nice. <laughs> so they are like, nice though, aren't they? They are pretty damn nice. <laughs> yeah, and, and generally if you know anyone posts a question about how to train up for a hike, most people tell them you don't need to train, just hiking will get you in shape. And that's I mean, I think that's kind of a absurd advice uh, when you look at uh, the probably the biggest reason people get off trail is injuries. And how do you prevent injuries? You train. Um, and so if we're telling people, don't worry, the trail will get you in shape and then people are getting injured, then something is not working there. Right. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, so that's that's what Couch to Trail is going to be is right now. All I've done is ported my old Appalachian Trail blog over to it. But. I am putting, uh, working to put content on there about, you know, how do you train up for a long distance hike? How do you eat 
well on a long distance hike and just all, you know, answer all of those questions that I feel like are kind of missing in the community right now. Um, and, and maybe that'll turn into something where I can keep, keep hiking and keep writing on, um, on those topics. So if people go there now, they'd only get, and it's couch to trail.com, I presume. Um, mm-hmm. that what will they get? They'll just, they'll, they'll get your blog, which is fine. And they, you're going to be adding other things as time goes on. Right. And if they want to sign up for the email list, I'm actually editing all of my uh, photos from the AT. I'm going to do a big photo dump to my email list and just get a bunch of really high res, um, high quality photos out there to them. So, you know, if they want to join the email list, then they can be uh, notified whenever I do put up the different topics on fitness and nutrition. I'm, I'm working on that this month. Uh, before I get on the Arizona Trail. Funnily enough, that was the other thing I wanted to ask you because you sent me a couple of pictures, or some great pictures as well. And you talked about taking a um, an SLR camera, or was it DSLR, an SLR camera on the trail with you, which is quite a an additional weight penalty. Do you think it was worth it to take a, a big camera when you could have used an iPhone? Oh, I, I, I mean, personally, definitely. I just really enjoy photography. I really enjoy videography. So um, it was worth it to me to capture all of those moments. Um, and, and my pack was just absurdly heavy anyway, um, which, uh, <laughs> how yeah. much was it? How much was it? Then? So going up Mount Madison, right in Pinkham notch, we went southbound. There is a, a little scale and my pack was 56 pounds then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and You're it's, crazy. Funny. <laughs> it's funny cause I, I went to Walmart to resupply and they had this ham on sale and I was like, Oh, it's five pounds of ham at 99 cents a pound. Well, I got to buy it. So I was carrying five <laughs> pounds of ham up Mount Madison. Oh, I think I ate maybe a pound of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to tell everybody listening, that is not good advice. Do not buy a five pound ham on top of your 56 pound pack. Not a great yeah, idea. <laughs> I, I would agree. Um, and so, yeah, that was, I, I, I think I was, I had so much just like camera stuff and just other stuff that at some point I just stopped caring about the weight. And so I, I carried way too much weight through the whole thing. Wow. Um, definitely not advised, but it's an interesting point because I never got injured through this whole thing, carrying this just ridiculous pack. Um, yeah. Even yeah. though, you know, yeah, so I think that's, that speaks to the benefits of preparing yourself fitness wise. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get yeah. away with just <laughs> these absurdly <laughs> dumb, dumb things that you do. Uh, but uh, yeah, carrying a DSLR, I mean, it was, um, it was great. I'm, I'm, Definitely for my next trips, I'm going lighter. I bought a, a, a different camera, a mirrorless camera that'll be lighter and carrying a lighter lens. So like, you know, now I'm in the mindset of I, I need to shave ounces. So, um, but, oh, really? I, but I still, okay. yeah, you know, I still want to carry those, um, that camera because it's, I think it's pretty, it's pretty rare. So it's nice to be able to show someone, you know, really high quality video, really sure. high quality photos from a through hike, just because not many people will want to carry that extra weight. You're going to post them on uh, YouTube? Yeah, yeah. So I'll post uh, the videos on YouTube and I'll, you know, I'll be posting photos and whatnot on that Cash to Trail blog um, as I go along. I tell you what, I'd love to have you back on just when you finish your, if you've got time between the Arizona Trail and the CDT, just to tell us about the Arizona Trail because I drove through Arizona on the way back from California this year. It was freaking gorgeous there. So you're going to love how beautiful it is. You must have some, you'll have some fantastic photos to share as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, I love to love to come back on. Yeah, that area, the, um, you know, I've spent a, quite a bit of time in Utah and just that desert out there yeah. is uh, something else. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. But th- well, look, thanks for take, taking the time to have a chat with us. Um, and good luck on your three, nearly 4,000 miles of hiking this year, you crazy fella. And don't take a 56 pound pack or a five pound ham with you either. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Steve. I really enjoyed this conversation. Okay, okay, buddy. I'll speak to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> His pack weighed 56 pounds. I can't believe it, you know. I'll tell you, these ex-military are so suited to the AT. They can carry that stuff without breaking sweat, apparently. I love that expression, make it through to the next mill. That really is appropriate for the AT, isn't it? It's got an interesting life model, I guess you'd call it. He sets up some passive income, then heads out onto a trail. Very nice indeed. And what about his plans this year? <laughs> He's got an 800-mile warm-up on the Arizona Trail before taking on the 3,000-mile Continental Divide Trail. He's an interesting guy, and I liked him a lot. By the way, 
I'm sure you're all impressed with the way I was agreeing with him about the importance of training prior to a hike. This is from somebody whose idea of training was to pitch up at the top of Springer and work out things from there. I did my training on the trail. I didn't want to peak too soon. We've got another five-star review this week from MediocreShow.com. <laughs> I thought, that got to be good. But no, he likes the show. He says that he found the show while planning for a section hike two months ago. He's all caught up. He says that Steve has now become the voice in my head when I think about hiking. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, MediocreShow.com. That must be kind of disturbing for you. He also says that he thinks he may have post-podcast archive depression now that I have to wait for each episode every week. It's called Patience, MediocreShow.com. Now, not in a normal role, here is Hiker Lynn. And we're back on with Lynn again. And this is our sort of attempt to wean us off Dr. Lynn and coming back to Hiker Lynn. And Lynn is going to tell us about the Charles Ives trail is it the trail charles Ives trail in danbury connecticut and then yeah. and she sent me a beautiful map there's a lovely link to a map which i'm going to um, put on in the show notes as well so tell us about this this trail then then so i thought that this would be a great uh trail to talk about when you wanted to speak about shorter trails mm. um kind of uh shakedown trails this trail happens to be right in my backyard, and I've done a number of sections of this trail several times. It's a 20-mile trail, mm -hmm. and it's named for the composer Charles Ives, who was born and raised in Danbury, Connecticut, okay. and he actually won a Pulitzer Prize in 1947 for one of his compositions. You, Steve, would actually be interested to know that Composing was actually his hobby, and he made his real money as an insurance agent down in New York City. But he was actually surprisingly quite well known in the insurance industry, and he had a very big business. And then he would, in New York City, he, uh, that's where he had his, his business, and he would come up to Danbury, Connecticut, which is about an hour and a half train ride up from New York City, yeah. uh, spend the weekends and um, enjoy going out into the mountains around here and composing based on his, his inspiration that he derived from being in the woods. How nice. The Charles Ives Trail is, as I said, it's a 20-mile trail through Ridgefield, Bethel, Danbury, and Reading. And uh, along that trail, uh, one particular spot is the ruins of a summer cabin that he had. And actually, the only thing that's left standing is this stone hearth and fireplace. Mm -hmm. And it's up just past the top of Pine Mountain. And if you walk up Pine Mountain, uh, you see you can look south all the way down to Long Island Sound. It's a beautiful, beautiful vista. And this trail takes you along Bennett's Pond, uh, which is a pond that has beaver lodges, takes you over some brooks and around some waterfalls and then up, up, up to the top of Pine Mountain. And then it takes you along a couple of miles in this beautiful uh, deciduous and pine forest that is so peaceful. I hiked it a couple of years ago with my dog, and I think it's what probably was one of my most favorite hikes that I've ever done because wow. of the peace and tranquility that I felt. And literally right in my backyard. Oh, nice. And then you go down to uh, one of the, the main roads that you have to cross over and then up again to another mountain that's up in Danbury called Mootry Peak. And again, you can see all throughout Danbury from that point. Again, traveling down, down the mountain on the other side, going eastward through the deep woods of Redding, Connecticut. And again, I love sometimes to actually listen to Charles Ives' music while I'm actually walking the trail because y you can really feel the inspiration. Oh, wow. That's, he, not, that's a pretty cool thing to like, do. Yeah, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. He wrote things like uh, The Camp Meeting, which is about Putnam Camp, which is a place in Reading, Connecticut. He wrote a place, uh, something called Three Places in New England. He wrote a piano piece called Sunrise. All, all sorts of, of amazing things, and of course, a couple of symphonies uh, as well. So who, who maintains the trail then? Is, it, is there a club that does that? Yes. 
um, there's a special club that does see to it, and but but they're not the only ones. There's the Danbury, the city of Danbury, the, the town of Ridgefield, town of Reading. They all have very very active outdoor clubs. Ridgefield, my my hometown has the Ridgefield Open Space Association, uh, maintains part of the Charles Ives Trail. Uh, but also maintains a total of 52 miles of hiking trails in in my little town. Um, oh, so that's a, that's uh, a lot it, of work to do, isn't it? Really, to keep these things uh, in good shape. And, and how accessible is the trail? Right off of a major highway. Actually, I, w- I was thinking about it a little earlier. You could actually access the eastern portion of the Charles Ives Trail from New York City. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that's br- that is cool. That is cool. Yeah, you you take the train from New York City. You have to transfer, but you could take it all the way to a stop called West Reading, and then you can walk about a half mile on side cut road, and boom, you're at the trailhead. That's so nice. I I just thought about this, realized this just just today when I was thinking about the trail, mm. and I said, wow, people people from New York can actually access this trail without having to you know drive somewhere. Yeah. How how high, how high does it go? You said you said was it Pine Mountain was one of the ones you said. Is that the highest it goes to? I think Mootry Peak might be the a little bit higher. I do not have elevations for you uh, off the top of my head. Okay. It's not. It's not overly. You know, I think there's maybe about a 700 foot elevation change, but you're going up and down two good mountains. All right. So is it doable in a day? 20 miles, quite a long way, isn't it? For in one day. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is doable in a day, as long you know the day has got to be pretty long. But you can do it. I've done it in a couple of sections. I know that probably it takes me about three to four hours to do about half of it. Nice. Um, do people camp on the trail and stay out overnight and just do it in two days? There there are certain places that you can camp. I know in Ridgefield there are designated camping areas that right. you have to get a permit from the town. I don't know about Danbury. And I'm not going to comment about stealth camping. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> Is there such, I, I know they call it stealth camping, but what does that mean? Do people get arrested for stealth camping? I, I can't imagine there'd be too many people patrolling around to check up where, where, you, where you're camping. Yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know. I just hear You really about are it. not going to make a comment, are you? <laughs> I am not going to make a comment. <laughs> oh, dear. So it sounds lovely. And is there a particularly good time to go? What's Connecticut like? I can't, I can't recall. I remember going through oh, Connecticut, gosh. obviously. Any time of year is great. I've actually hiked it in all, on all uh, different type, times of the year. Really hot summer, beautiful fall. Two years ago, we, we have a, a another family that we love to hike, do a New Year's Day hike, or at least New Year's weekend. And two years ago, all eight of us and two dogs hiked part of the trail up to Pine Mountain. Nice. And uh, we have this amazing picture of the, of all, all ten of us out there. Send us the picture. I'd like to put it in the show notes as well. I, I will. I will, Do definitely. That. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, that's, that's lovely. It sounds, it sounds gorgeous. And uh, I wish, you know, living in Florida, there is – We've got this place called the Celery Fields, which is basically about 70 feet high. <laughs> we're, we're at oh ground my. level. We go up to 70 feet high. That's our mountain. And then we walk around <laughs> to the top of there and come down again. I mean, really, that's about it. So you can't do any of that. But to have a 20-mile trail, I would love the idea of get up early in the morning and just head out and do a 20-mile trail. Oh, that would be just absolutely perfect. But thanks yeah. for that. That yeah. sounds, sounds lovely. And anybody wanting to do a shakedown hike, that sounds like a lovely opportunity. And if you send me that picture, that would be great. Terrific. I will. All right, then. I'll speak, well, I will speak to you soon, no doubt, even though we won't be recording in. But I'm sure uh, I speak for everybody to thank you for your contribution to the show. It's been wonderful speaking with you. And you've really helped us and help people uh, learn more about health on the trail. And I, I get more and more requests now for doctors, Dr. Lynn's first aid kit. So uh, I think that's pretty cool as well. Well, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed my time uh, speaking with you and being part of this podcast, and I look forward to meeting a lot of our fellow listeners on the trail. That'd be cool. That'd be lovely. Okay, Lynn, speak with well. We'll speak with you soon. Okay. Take All right. Easy. You take care. Bye. Bye. There were a few continuity issues with that recording. First, it was supposed to come after our discussion about post-trial depression. But I'm afraid we haven't recorded that yet. So there was I thanking Lynn for the work she's put into the show as she's coming back again next week. Sorry about that, but I think I'll thank her again next week as well. 
Second, when Lynn thought that I'd be interested that Charles Ives was involved in the insurance industry, I made some inane comment and cracked myself up, totally distorting the audio, so I had to cut that part out. I wasn't ignoring her, I promise. Next week, we're going to hear from Anna Huthmaker and the dance of the real woman. Let's face it, that title alone should make you want to tune in again. Just before we go, don't forget the normal stuff of supporting Bruce's show on Returning to Katahdin and our sponsor, Trailtopia. Remember also, I really want to hear from you about the ways in which I can improve the show. I mean it. Honest, I do. Lastly, we're on to the second part of Chapter 9 of Earl Schaefer's Walking with Spring. Having moved into New Jersey and, of course, passing that nudist camp, Earl has a bit of a run-in with a raccoon in a shelter, then fulfills a promise to keep in touch with the Appalachian Trail Conference. I'll see you next week. Come and gaze in reverie across the mountain maze. Palisades Interstate Park is a woodland playground for millions north of New York City and easily accessible. The first miles of Trailway, built deliberately for the AT, were built there under park leadership soon after Benton Mackay suggested the project. The insignia university associated with the trail originated there. The proprietor of a service station in the village of Arden, where I stopped to get a map, told of a man who woke up one morning at a shelter and found his bacon gone, even though he had hung it from a tree limb. The next night, he hung out some more and stayed awake to watch, finally seeing a raccoon climb up and repeat the theft. So what happened at Fingerboard Mountain Lean-To shouldn't have surprised me. The shelter is built of stone on top of a gigantic boulder with a tin roof and a fireplace in each end wall. The water supply is far downhill, so I brought in an extra kettle full and set it on a ledge to be handy in the morning. My pack was slung overhead to discourage mice. The moon was crystal bright. About midnight, the kettle rattled, waking me in time to see a ringed tail disappear around the corner. The second time, the coon didn't bother to leave, just sat and blinked while I shined a light. Then the rascal discovered a box of spaghetti someone had left in the shelter, picked it up with four paws and hopped out front in the moonlight, ripped open the box and began to chew noisily, got thirsty and drank from my kettle went back to the pasta again. My only regret was lack of flash equipment for the camera. Next time, it was dirt falling on my face that woke me. The coon was now bold enough to try to reach my pack, which was directly above my head. This required some upside-down gymnastics. I yelled and it scrambled away, but soon came back. Now I was ready with a long stick and whacked the pesky critter a few times. This time it stayed away, but dawn soon came. I stared at the shelter roof for a moment, wondering, had I been dreaming? One glance out front was sufficient. There was the evidence, the chewed remains of a pound of spaghetti. At Lake Tiaradi Circle, I stopped to register at the ranger station. The trailway beyond was plagued by mosquitoes and black flies, the latter so vicious I muffled my head in my sweater. The flimsy netting obtained in Virginia had long since disintegrated. At Lederop Mountain, another stone shelter had a fireplace in a stone centre column. Beyond was a lookout showing Bear Mountain and the weather station at the summit. The ascent of Bear Mountain was up the steep face. Near the top, chiselled into solid rock, was this inscription, Vogel State Park, Georgia, 1200 miles. The view south from Bear Mountain is over the Tappan Zee, where the Hudson River widens to four miles before narrowing again at the Palisades. This region was featured in the stories of Washington Irving about the Dutch who first colonised New York. North of Bear Mountain is the West Point Military Reservation. During the Revolution, a colossal hand-forged chain was stretched across the river to prevent the British fleet from going upstream. The chain was held up by enormous wooden floats and stretched from Bear Mountain to Antony's Nose on the opposite shore. This peak supposedly was named by Henry Hudson because of a resemblance to one of his crewmen. A museum and amusement park are operated by the State Park Commission and the American Museum of Natural History at Bear Mountain. The crossing of the Hudson River was on the Bear Mountain Bridge, a massive structure similar to the Golden Gate Bridge at San Francisco. To my astonishment, I was charged five cents to walk across, the only toll paid on the long cruise. It's a wonder they didn't charge me truck rates. 
This crossing, incidentally, is the lowest point on the Appalachian Trail, the river being practically at sea level. The trail ascended St Anthony's Nose on steep and rocky footing. From topside, the view of the Catskills to the northwest recalled the story of Rip Van Winkle. Was this the 20th year, by any chance, when Henry Hudson and his crew of the Half Moon returned for their legendary carousal? East from the river, the trail crossed level terrain, sometimes swampy and ideal for mosquitoes. To escape them, I camped that night on an exposed spot above a large boulder and started a smudge fire, putting it to windward so the smoke would pass above my head. This helps and isn't too bothersome, as long as you keep your head down. Fine weather, sunny and breezy, encouraged rapid progress the following day, through a region of small lakes bordered by masses of flowers. Then came Cannabis Lake and a devious path to the lean-to on the far side. This shelter stood on a mossy ledge and was neatly built, the logs being so uniform and so nicely notched that no chinking was necessary. Surprisingly, there was almost no vandal carving. On the back wall was a register containing many comments on the spring. One said, the water looks green, but it tastes all right. I didn't need to sample it. Rain came and fell intermittently throughout the night, filling a kettle placed under the overhang and stopping before daylight. This was the last shelter seen for several days. From Canopus Lake, the trail passed through a region of summer homes, mostly on roads and past Taconic Parkway. Just beyond, nailed to a tree, was a hand-painted sign announcing a grocery store in the front room of a nearby house. The lady said she had started the enterprise because her neighbours complained of having no place to buy food in the community. Every item she stocked was judged on whether her own family approved it. Four or five Scotch-Irish offspring looked none the worse for their role as guinea pigs. In fact, they looked real healthy and rambunctious. Farther along, the day turned foggy as I came to a quiet glade where a slight movement to the side alerted me to a white-tailed doe and a fawn moving slowly through the undergrowth, so like a slim young heifer browsing by and closely followed by her spotted fawn. A stumble step, a self-rebuking sigh, and silently as wraiths the two were gone. Then the trail turned between some ramshackle, unpainted buildings. A puzzling quietude, almost abandonment, was there, and yet I sensed a presence. Beyond the buildings, the trail became well-worn, with a wire stretched alongside on poles. Then a little old man with a long stick was coming slowly toward me. His head was turned toward a robin singing somewhere in the mist. On his face was a rapt expression. He didn't seem to hear my greeting at first, then answered in a low voice, with a gentle smile and downcast eyes, and moved on by. Only then did I realise that the old man was blind, and that someone had stretched the wire along the trail for him to follow through the woods by means of the staff. At the village of Holmes during the afternoon, I paused to perform a momentous duty. So far, the Appalachian Trail Conference had received no communication from me, but the time had come. A conference was scheduled to begin within a few days at Fontana Village in North Carolina, and a message of greeting was appropriate. Unless something drastic occurred, the success of my trek was now assured, and I ought to let my presence be known. On a folded sheet of paper, I sketched a likeness of the pinnacles of the Dan, and put beneath... The flowers bloom, the songbirds sing, and though it's sun or rain, I walk the mountain tops with spring, from Georgia north to Maine. Inside was the date of departure from Oglethorpe and the expected date of arrival at Katahdin. Months later I was told by Jean Stevenson that the message was received in the mail at Fontana. Is it somewhere in ATC files? Much of the trail in eastern New York followed roads passing the properties of such prominent individuals as Lowell Thomas, the famous traveller and news commentator, and Thomas Dewey, then a candidate for the presidency. Appalling, I got involved in a discussion about the army and the late war, delaying me so much that daylight was fading as I hastened through Quaker Hill. Bad weather was closing in as I finally turned aside into a dense woods and spent an uncomfortable night in the rain. Talking when you should have been walking, says I to myself. The morning takeoff was soon, but the weather improved as I passed through Webertuck and came to the Connecticut line at Shattercoke Mountain. According to the register there, the place ought to be called Rattlesnake Heaven, or just the opposite, depending on the viewpoint. Entries indicated that 40 or more of the noisome reptiles had been killed or captured by hikers or snake hunters within a few years' time. The area now seemed clear of them, but the advice was to avoid sitting down before looking. 
Another entry was by two girls who had evidently come from the other direction over rugged terrain. The entry said, We hate the Appalachian Trail, so there. Perhaps they'd even come over the ledge loop, which I was to see shortly. At a fork in the trail, one sign said, Notch loop for use in bad weather or with heavy loads. The other said, Ledge loop, strenuous, dangerous in wet or icy weather. You can guess which one I chose. The ledges sometimes were no more than a foot wide, but the real hazard was an overhang, scaled by means of a tyre chain dangling from a tree root. The only way was by rappelling in reverse, hand over hand with feet or knees against the cliff. The chain and the root withstood the strain, and so did I, just barely. In the far valley was a rocky knoll, with the topside boulders covered with painted names and initials. At the very top was a wooden cross in remembrance of a twenty-year-old man. By early evening the lone expedition entered Macedonia Brook State Park and came uphill through the twilight to a nice lean-to. This was the first shelter since Canopus Lake, a very welcome sight. Later, when the fire had burned low, a light rain began falling, pattering on the roof and pelting the fire so that it hissed and warbled almost a melody. The firelight reflected from leaves overhead, creating a niche in the solitude, like a room in the green mansions, immortalised by Hudson.